so I'm, I'm going to stay quite literally to the um, title <clears throat> of what we are talking about, you know, driving value from space, and, and share some of the thoughts of how we have built our company and, and, and the kind of like engagement that we like uh, to be uh, having. It's really focused around, um, you know, those three words, um, listen, execute, iterate. Listen driven by talking to the people who want to be, uh, who you want to have as your customers, rather than starting by, you know, I got some cool technology, right? So I'm, I'm a physicist, I'm a geek, um, I love my satellites, but um, having spent the majority of my life actually in the business world, I also know that the vast majority of business people don't, how should I say, don't give a rat's ass about our cool technology. What they do care about is the impact that it has um, on your business, right? And so when we, when we started um, uh, Aspire, we thought about what's the natural habitat for those small satellites, those, you know, size of a good bottle of whiskey um, floating above in space, where can they add value? Where can they augment what is done by the traditional space sector, the large satellites? Um, because I'm, I'm a big um, uh, fighter of this, of this um, uh, debate. Is it like old space or new space? Is it large satellites or small satellites? I, I find this is you know, utterly missing the point. Um, there are things that you can do great with uh, a large number of small satellites, and there are things that you're just completely impossible to accomplish with small satellites, and you need um, large devices, some of which have to be actually government funded. So we thought about uh, where is the natural habitat for a large number of satellites, and realized that over land, there is actually lots of ways to gather data. But if you reach the other 75% of the planet, the oceans and the truly remote areas, the only way actually to gather data there is through satellites, right? And if you want a, a high frequency, high accuracy coverage there, you need to actually have a technology where you can launch a large number of satellites, so they have to be um, small enough that it is economically uh, viable, and you have to have launch opportunities to get them there on a repeated basis, which is exactly the particular um, if we were to borrow a, a term from, uh, from biology, um, ecologic niche where uh, those small satellites uh, fit in, right? And so um, uh, we basically built satellites that listen um, to the 75% of the planet, which is um, very remote and oceans, right? Now, if you think about space companies, and I, I, I've stopped going to space conferences um, because they are actually, I think, are missing the point. Right? If you look at companies that are space companies or traditional technology companies, um, they're basically exactly the same thing. Right? You start with having a product that customers actually need. Um, uh, you listen to them as you refine your product. Then you execute on delivering that product, and then you do it again. Right? So there is nothing unique about space companies in that sense. Yes, kind of, sort of, right? So there are a few things which are unique about space companies and some other uh, industries as well, and those are the things that I um, uh, thought I'll, I'll spend a few minutes talking about, right? Um, uh, the first one is, is that going to you know, some of the well-known uh, conferences, um, we seem to be um, I would say plagued by a particularly high concentration of geeks that get very, very excited about a second iteration antenna unfolding beam pattern in the EIRP. And we are capable of having 15 minute presentations and PowerPoint slides on that one element. Fascinating, right? Um, so unfortunately, that cool tech actually doesn't sell any products, right? And I think we as an industry really need to evolve away from that and, 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 and catch up with the um, customers want solutions, right? Um, recruiting, I think, is a challenge, not only for the space sector, but I think globally. Um, it's probably my personal single biggest concern, uh, one of the reasons why we have locations in in the Americas, in San Francisco, in the UK, 
um, for Europe and in Singapore for Asia, is that globally, I believe that um, uh, in, in 20 years, 40% of global GDP will be driven by the collection, analysis, and use of data, which means that you need people that are capable of generating data, analyzing data, um, and manipulating it, which is generally people coming out of the um, science, technology, engineering, and math field, the STEM field. Now, if you look at globally what is the um, uh, demand for STEM people, um, it is going up by about 13, 14%. And the supply is going up by about three and a half percent. So basically, we're driving a car at 10 percent exponential growth towards a wall, and we're not really doing much about it. Right? So the single most scarce resource for me as a company, for you know, for us as economy, as a group over the next you know 20, 30 years, is people. I'm not worried about oil. I'm not worried about energy. I'm not worried about food. I'm Actually, the essay not worried about climate change, um, even though it's absolutely real. But I am worried about that we don't have the people uh, that we will need to solve many of those problems, right? And I think in the space sector in particular, because it is actually a high-tech industry, um, uh, it turns out that building and launching satellites is actually a little bit of rocket science. I thought it wasn't. Turns out I was wrong. Um, so we do have a recruiting challenge, I think, in general, right? Um, the next one is, is that by its very definition, space is global. Right? You can build a local enterprise in, in a lot of other industries, from, from food to manufacturing um, to printing to you know, tailoring. Um, you will find virtually no space company that is doing 90% of its business within driving distance. Right? So even if you are a small company, you have to think very, very global, right? You know, if I think of, uh, uh, of Craig here, who is, you know, I think the pioneer in Scotland, um, he is having a global business basically from day one, right? And those are challenges um, uh, that, that are not to be underestimated. At the same token, I think they're a huge opportunity for European companies, which are doing that significantly better than some of our friends you know, uh, across the pond, which by their nature are very, very insular. Right? And I, just, I filled out um, a questionnaire for, for one of our financing rounds, and the, the, the first question was, which state is 90% of your business coming from? And I said, what do you mean state? You know, I don't have a country where 90% of our business come from. Right? So I wrote back to him and says, I can't fill it out. And says, well, then we can't fund you. So we, we, we figured it out, they did fund us, right? But it, it shows how, um, in a sense, often insular, um, uh, you know, America can be. And I think for us Europeans, uh, uh, it's far more common to say, you know, you know, I got customers in France and in Austria, and, you know, sorry, did I say France? Sorry, I'm, I'm, uh, Italy. Um, uh, and, and so we are, we are more open to this internationalist, but it is something that we have to be aware of when we are building company in this sector locally, then they will need help being global almost from day one, right? Um, and then the, ne the next one is, is uh, the speed of development in the space sector um, is more different from the last 10 years today than in almost any other sector. When we talk to our customers and says, yeah, we, we launch satellites every single month. Says, you mean decades? No, no, every single month. Well, how did you do that? Well, we built one a week. That does not compute for many, many people in the traditional space sector, right? But that is the speed at which innovation is happening. Three years ago, um, communication speed from CubeSats was, you know, 1,200 bouts, which I still remember that I had in Melbourne, you know, 1,200 bouts. Um, uh, today, people are demonstrating 150 megabits per second from CubeSats. If you had said three years ago in, 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 uh, in Utah that, you know, in three years there's going to be 150 megabits from a CubeSat, someone would have taken out their phone, dialed 911, person needs medical attention. Okay? So the speed and the 24-hour operation of our customers uh, from the satellites flying is, is, is another, I would say, challenge, as, uh, as Peter mentioned beforehand, that is somewhat unique to the space sector because the change is so dramatic 
compared to, let's say, you know, the cell phone industry, right? Where everyone is used to already dramatic um, uh, changes that are happening. So, if you look at that um, uh, a little bit more, more in detail, the first one is this kind of like, you know, customers don't care about features, they care about benefits. Um, I personally need a little bit of time to understand that sentence when it was first told to me by an investor in Silicon Valley. Um, today it is a mantra for me. Right? They don't care about you know, the features that my satellites have or that my ground stations have. They don't care about any of the technology that I have um, as much about the benefits that it is bringing to them. Right? So we are working very, very hard with our salespeople to not talk about you know, the size of our satellites or the power on board or any of the other kind of stuff, right? Because those are features of our technology. Those are not benefits to the customer. Sometimes customers are so used to space people throw um, features at them that they are asking us and we don't tell them. We respond back with, you get the data within 20 minutes. We will see every single area, every single ship every 15 minutes. Right? And we focus on the benefits for the customers. Right? And I think that's like a, a really, really important story. Um, in, uh, what helps us is that we get people from entirely different industries working for us. Right? So we have engineers and salespeople um, where only a small percentage are actually from the space industry. And the large number is from, you know, we have people from oil and gas that are building our satellites. We have people from, uh, from banking that are um, uh, doing a relationship sales of our um, um, uh, uh, data. We have people from the gaming industry that work on, uh, on ARCS. Because it turns out that game developers do quaternions in their head, like literally in their head. So when we thought that you know, ARCS, that ADCS is difficult, you can talk to some game developers, right? Um, they do really complicated stuff. Um, the other thing which is happening, I believe, uh, in the space industry is, is the change from uh, owning an asset to having a service, right? I think more and more of, of the customers are less interested in, in owning an asset or having you build a satellite or some other things for them, but just like getting a service. So the same way as we have software as a service, data as a service, dot, dot, dot as a service, uh, the same thing is happening uh, in space, where more and more companies are doing things like, you know, um, from Seagate to Dropbox, from Space Shuttle to SpaceX, um, from, uh, you know, uh, Copernicus to, you know, just, you know, getting uh, the data, right? Um, I think I've talked a lot already about, about the recruiting challenge. Um, be creative about it, right? You know, as I just mentioned, you know, we have people from the oil and gas sector that have deep understanding of, of complicated sensors installed in, in bad environments, and they are building our satellites and are enormously qualified and quite excited about doing that as well. Um, and last but, but not least, you know, is, is, the, is, the, is the global story here, right? Um, it doesn't really matter how you do it. Um, you can do it by opening offices like we did. Um, you can do it by building partnerships, how um, you know, Peter has done it, how Swake has done it, how many other, um, how Rob has done it. Um, uh, across the world, but you have to think global and leverage the, um, I would say, advantage as a European that thinking global is something that comes natural to us um, uh, to do, right? And with that then comes that you have 24-hour operations and you are able to operate um, uh, at the speed at which the industry actually is moving. And yeah, so we aspire, we're here, we're excited to be here. Um, uh, it, was a, it was a tough competition, I have to admit, in Europe to choose a location. And uh, I'm very excited that um, uh, we are here now. Um, uh, we get an office here. We get um, uh, uh, a large number of job requisitions open in, in Scotland, as well as in San Francisco and in, in Singapore. And uh, you can find us in Sky Park. Thanks. I'm excited to be here. <laughs>